In this video, we're going to make a data class in Kotlin, and we are going to store the data that we gather from the user in this form into an object of that data class when the user presses the Save button. We're going to be considering this specimen data class here, which we have not yet created. So let's consider how it fits within our entire application. We already have the plant data class, and this gets populated from a JSON feed using Retrofit, from our plant DAO, to our plant service, to our view model, to our main activity. And we see that in the emulator when I start typing a plant name, and we see that it auto-completes with a series of suggestions. So, what's the relation between a plant and a specimen? Well, my definition of a plant is the scientific definition of a plant. In other words, a genus, species, cultivar, and common name. There are certain things we can say about all red oak trees, for instance. They have a given height, they have a given native area, they have a given fall color, so on and so forth. But then a specimen is a specific red oak tree. This is easiest to demonstrate with example. We see here a map of plants that I've GPSed, and we can zoom in to Cincinnati. We can see naturally several that I've GPSed in Cincinnati. We go into the zoo. We can continue to drill down until we see a series of GPS points, and these indicate specimens. So silver maple, uh, bladder nut, so on and so forth. Each of these is a unique plant that has been GPSed, and that's what I would call a specimen. But we'll see that they'll all relate to a plant because we can see the plant at the top here, and then we can see a series of specimens underneath. That gives us a one-to-many relationship between plant and specimen. One plant can have multiple specimens. Let's consider the attributes that we're going to need for our specimen class. We're going to need a plant ID, or essentially a foreign key back to that plant concept. We could also have a plant name, although we could actually get that from that relationship, that many-to-one relationship from specimen to plant. So we'll consider that. Location would be something like the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens. Description, something we want to say about this specimen, and then date planted. As we continue to create this application, we're going to have more and more attributes, like latitude and longitude. But that's the nice thing about having a data class, is that we can expand the attributes that we have in that data class over time as we add new features. Let's create our data class under our DTO package. I'll right-click, New Kotlin Class, and we'll call it Specimen. Now for a data class, we simply say data, and then class, and then inside of this we will put our attributes and or our parameters, if you will. And we know it's a good idea to give them defaults many times, so that we can pass in only what we need to pass in. You see I've created several attributes here, all with default values, so plant ID initialized to zero, Plant name, initialized to nothing. Specimen ID we have as a string. And I'm being a bit forward thinking here because I know I'm eventually going to save this into Firebase, which is going to use alphanumeric characters as unique identifier. So I'm going to make that a string, and that is essentially going to be an ID that we get from Firebase. Location, description, date planted, all strings initialized to simply empty string. So these are all optional. And we know in Kotlin, if we have optional parameters, we don't need to pass them in. And as a matter of fact, we can pass in parameters out of order because we can specify which of these we're passing in at the time we are constructing an object of this class. So that's our data class. Let's go back now to our main activity and consider how we want to populate this data class. We have a good head start here because we already put a button on our screen. We did that in the previous video. And we have it showing a toast, and that toast is showing that the data that the user entered. One footnote, this plant name here we no longer use. I might do a bit of refactoring on that. But nonetheless, we know this is the button where we want to create our specimen object. So we have a couple of options. We could simply say... If our specimen is new specimen, we'll go ahead and import. And we could pass in each of these values into the specimen constructor. And we could identify them each with their properties. So I could say plant name equals plant name, comma, location equals location, comma. 
description equals description comma date planted equals date planted. And I'll take off the dollar sign. That's just an artifact from using it in a string. So this would work because note that we are identifying each parameter with the parameter name that we gave in specimen, plant ID, plant name, specimen ID, location, description, so on and so forth. So that's one way to do it. And we see the red line has gone away. That works perfectly fine. If you want to do it that way, do it that way. But one other option that we have, remember our scoped functions. Scoped functions allow us to have a block of code where we're executing all of the code on one particular object. That might work a little bit better here because we might want to transform some of this data before we store it in with specimen. We might want to do some validation. We might want to reformat it. And that would be a bit clunky if we put it all inside of one function call, where a scoped function allows us to do a little bit of math on each of these before we actually assign it into the specimen. So for the scoped function that I want to use here, I would like something where I can refer to the object directly without using a variable name. So that would be a this call. And I also want to have it so it's not an extension function. So apply works out best in this case. Let's see how it works. I'm going to create the specimen object and I'll take out all of the stuff I passed into the constructor. We'll go ahead and take advantage of our defaults and simply use the empty constructor. And then I say dot apply. And notice it kind of helps me out here. Now within this, notice that the this object refers to the specimen that I have just created. So I can refer to those attributes that I declared in the specimen constructor directly. Plant name, plant ID, location, description, date planted. And then I can use our assignment operator and assign our user input to these different fields. Now it's going to get a little bit tricky because if we scroll up a little bit, you'll notice that I use the exact same word to declare the variables that are going to hold this user data. And those are temporary variables. They're just here within our function to store whatever the user has entered. So let me try to make it a little more clear which is which. I'm going to rename each of these and we'll simply call this, I'll add the word in before each of those. That way it's obvious what's holding the user data and the attributes that we're using inside of our specimen object. Now notice I haven't done anything with plant name. That's because this variable is actually obsolete. We're no longer using plant name here because we added that autocomplete text view like component in a previous video. So that one I'm going to do a little bit differently. The value that was stored in plant name is now stored in a variable called str selected data. Let's be consistent. Let's go ahead and rename that one to in plant name. And now when we return to our uh, specimen construction, this is going to look a, a lot more familiar. So plant name, plant ID, we've not yet defined, but we will soon. I'll keep that at zero. Location, description, it looks like when I did that refactor, it misunderstood what these were. So hopefully now it's a bit more clear. You can see that plant name, plant ID, location, description, and date planted. Those are all the attributes on our specimen object, where in plant name, in location, in description, in date planted, those are the variables that are holding the data that the user has typed into our user interface. So what we're doing here, we're taking the data that the user typed in, we're assigning that to an attribute of the specimen object. Specimen attribute on the left, user data on the right. So we're looking pretty good so far, but we still need to figure out this plant ID. And the plant ID is going to come from our plant class. So we have genus species common cultivar, and then we have this ID over here. So that's what we want to store in the plant ID. But the trick is, how do we get that? That's actually a bit trickier than we would think because that is something we have to get from the plant object itself. And where are we getting the plant object? Well, the plant object is this thing that we're passing into our autocomplete text view type component. It comes into this list of plants type, which is stored in data in. So this gets a little bit tricky. Basically what we have to do is when the user types something into our autocomplete, 
we not only have to get the text that the user typed into that autocomplete, but we also have to get the plant object that is representing that text in the autocomplete. Once we have that plant object, we can access any of those attributes on that plant object. See, here's how we're going to do it. In our autocomplete type component, we, we have this text field with dropdown, and notice that the plant collection is getting passed in and associated with the parameter called list. So this plant collection is what this autocomplete is using as we type to determine what matches. If we scroll down, there's this drop down menu and then the list dot for each. Remember again, that list is our collection of plant objects. And it's iterating over that list of plant objects and determining what to do if the user clicks on any of those plant objects. At this point, it's simply taking the text from that object and it's putting it into the text field that the user sees. We can do one more operation here. We can say selected plant equals text. Now that looks a bit weird. A selected plant equals text. Well, what we're doing here is this is a for each. And instead of using the default IT variable, that we've simply renamed it to text, but really under the covers, text is going to be a plant object. So we probably could rename that to be plant to make it a bit more clear. So what we're doing here is we're saying when the user clicks on this item, not only do we want to update the text that the user sees with the two string value that we get from that plant object, we also want to remember the plant object. And I'm going to save that into a new variable I'm calling selected plant. Now you notice this red lines because I've not yet declared that variable. So let's see what options we have. Uh, let's create property selected plant. Yep, that works. Let's declare it as a nullable type. So we'll put a question mark there and assign it to null. Now that feels dirty, but the neat thing is this lets me use another scoped function. The scoped function let is a really nice way to handle nullability in Kotlin. Note that with the let scope function, whatever object we're running this on is going to be referred to with the it or it variable. And also note that it's going to return a result. Let's see how it works. If I say selected plant, question mark dot let open and close curly. Now remember what the question mark means. It means that this is a nullable type. And then the period means, okay, run this function on that type. So uh, within this block, you notice that IT is referring to a plant object, specifically the plant object that's referred to by the selected plant variable. So I can simply say IT.ID, and that will get returned from the select block. And then I can assign IT.ID to plant ID, just like so. Now it gets even more cool because rem remember our Elvis operator, question mark colon, that tells us what to return if selected plant is null. Let's step back and look at that one more time. Selected plant is a nullable type. If it is not null, this block will run and it will return its ID and we will store that in plant ID. On the other hand, if it is null, then what comes to the right of the Elvis operator is going to get returned and zero will be stored in plant ID. No matter if it's null or not null, something will be stored in plant ID. Not null, it will be the actual plant. If it is null, it'll be the zero. So this construction is a common way to deal with both cases of a nullable variable. The If it's not null here, if it is null here, either way we get it taken care of, and that's a really nice way to handle nullability in Kotlin without using the force unwrap, or in other words, the double exclamation operator. Let's snap a breakpoint and see how this works. The emulator is available, so I'm going to start typing Eastern Redbud, and I'll select Eastern Redbud. Note as soon as I do that, a breakpoint hits where it is accepting our selected plant. Let's mouse over this very carefully, and you see that we see the string here, but if you look, it actually is the entire plant object with that ID 83, which is the unique identifier for the plant, which we're going to use is a foreign key from our specimen back to our plant. So let's go ahead and tell it to keep running. Location, we'll say University of Cincinnati. Description, beautiful spring blooms. And date planted, let's say October 19. 
95. And now here's the real tell. We hit save and this is going to trigger all of the logic that we just put together. So take the plant name that the user entered, store it in the plant name attribute of specimen, and so on and so forth. I will step over these lines and we'll take a look at the final result. Now we see our LEP clause. Remember this is where it's handling the nullability potential for, for a selected plant. And plant ID is what? That should be 83. And sure enough, it's 83 because we know that our selected plant is populated with the plant that the user picked from that dropdown. Location, going to be what the user typed in. Description, date planted. And we move to the next line so that we can investigate this specimen object down here in our variables. And take a look, the specimen object or an object of the data class specimen that we created has a date planted of October 1995, description, beautiful spring blooms, location, University of Cincinnati, plant ID of 83, which is the correct ID, plant name of Eastern Redbud, and then specimen ID has not yet been set. But nonetheless, if you take a look at what's down here in our variables tab, you see that it perfectly matches the user entry. So I'm going to go ahead and tell this to continue. And at this point, we have successfully created a specimen data class, and we have populated an object of this data class. This now opens up a whole lot of potential for us. We can take this object and store it in Firebase. We can take the object and we can store it in a room database. Stay tuned. We'll have future videos where we do more with the specimen object. As always, I hope this video has been helpful. I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.